James Cagney was an American actor, dancer, and film director, renowned for his consistently energetic performances, distinctive vocal style, and tough characters in the movies in which he starred. He gained recognition and significant awards for his diverse roles. His tough portrayals in films such as Taxi, Public Enemy, White Heat, and Angels with Dirty Faces made him a standout figure and a star in his own right. James Cagney had a unique way of speaking, characterized by distinctive intonation and rapid delivery becoming his signature. Sharp wit, memorable quotes, and a distinctive performance style added a special charm and charisma to his roles. James Francis Cagney was born in July 1899 in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, New York. Cagney had six siblings, two of whom passed away shortly after his birth. He himself was a delicate child, and his mother feared he might not survive long enough to be baptized. He later attributed his frail health to the poverty in which his family lived. The Cagney family resided in a poor neighborhood with dreadful sanitary conditions. His father was an amateur boxer and bartender, and the family struggled to make ends meet. After completing high school at Stuyvesant in New York, the blue-eyed, red-haired James Cagney enrolled in Columbia College with plans to study art. He also began learning German and joined the Student Army Training Corps. However, one semester into his studies during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, his father passed away, forcing James to drop out and return home. Instead of continuing his college education, James Cagney had to find work to support his family. He took on jobs as a doorman in a luxurious mansion and a hall boy at a hotel. Somehow, he even landed a position as a junior architect and draftsman. However, when Cagney secured a job at the New York Public Library, a dramatic turn occurred in his life. At the library, James Cagney met Florence James, who worked in the theater and believed he belonged there too. Cagney possessed certain skills that would make him an ideal performer. Since childhood, he had been tap dancing, was a skilled street fighter defending his older brother Harry when necessary, and also engaged in amateur boxing, securing the second position in the fight for the New York State Lightweight Championship title. James Cagney had an aunt who lived in Brooklyn, and by sheer coincidence, she lived right across the street from the Vitagraph studio. Cagney became obsessed with what was happening behind the studio fence. When curiosity got the better of him, he decided to climb the wall. It was then that he first witnessed the filming of a movie about John Bunny. This spectacular sight ignited such a passion in him that he was willing to do anything to become part of that world. However, James Cagney couldn't just barge into the Vitagraph studio and demand a job. He had to start from the bottom. Soon, he became a decorator for a Chinese pantomime in which his brother, Harry, started, and the show's director was Florence James, the very woman from the library. Initially content with being behind the scenes, Cagney had showed no interest in performing in front of an audience. However, fate intervened. On an ordinary day, Cagney was preparing the stage for the pantomime when suddenly it was announced that his brother, who was supposed to perform that evening, had fallen ill. James Cagney was asked if he knew the role, and upon receiving an affirmative answer, James was requested to replace his brother. With his good photographic memory, Cagney excelled in the role. Despite successfully taking the stage and immediately achieving success, Cagney wasn't convinced that he belonged there. Instead, in 1919, he took a job at Wanamaker's department store. One day, while goofing off at work, he started dancing. A colleague witnessed James dancing and informed him about an audition for a role in the upcoming play, Every Sailor. It was a wartime play with a chorus of soldiers dressed as women. The pay was $35 per week, much more than at the department store. However, there was a significant obstacle on the way to the role. Cagney only knew one dance, the intricate Peabody. So, while waiting for his audition, he observed the movements of other dancers, simultaneously learning them. By the time his turn came, he managed to grasp the movements and secure the job. James wasn't bothered by the fact that he had to play a female character. Later, he recalled how he overcame his natural shyness when he stepped on stage, because there, I'm not me. I ceased to be Jim Cagney when I walked out on that stage in a skirt, wig, powder, feathers, and sequins. Although James Cagney's mother was proud of her son's acting, she understood that theater work was not a stable job. She wanted her son to get an education. While Cagney didn't return to college, he got a job as a messenger at a brokerage firm. However, in his free time, he continued to attend auditions. Soon, he landed a role in the musical Pitter Patter by William B. Friedlander, earning $55 a week, of which he sent $40 every week to his mother. Besides the musical, he also worked as a dresser for one of the lead actors, carried actors' luggages, and served as a stand-in for the main character. During this time, James Cagney set his sights on one of the chorus girls, 
Frances Willard Vernon, and by 1922, they were married. Little did Cagney know that this marriage would last his entire life. Due to fertility issues, James Cagney and his wife adopted two children. In 1940, they adopted a son named James Francis Cagney III, and later a daughter named Kathleen Casey. Cagney was a very private person, and while he occasionally allowed the press to take photos with him, he typically spent his personal time away from the public eye. The actor preferred not to interact much with his children. His son distanced himself from Cagney, and they hadn't seen or spoken to each other since 1982. James Cagney passed away from a heart attack on January 27, 1984 in Washington, D.C., two years before his father's death. Cagney's only surviving child was his daughter. Kathleen also distanced herself from her father in the last years of his life and passed away on August 11, 2004. After his death, Cagney left nothing to his son's family and nothing to his daughter. Everything went to his wife, who had been by his side for 64 years. Francis Cagney died in 1994. After their marriage, the newlyweds toured separately with various troops, reuniting under the name Vernon and Nye to perform simple comedic and musical acts. Nye was a rearrangement of the last syllable of Cagney's surname. They worked steadily, but unfortunately money was still tight. In an effort to improve their financial situation, he and his wife traveled to California to take advantage of the opportunity to make films. They were overjoyed when they saw the palm trees and bright lights. However, Hollywood did not recognize their talent and turned them away. The dance studio Cagney established had few clients and closed down. With Vernon, they visited numerous studios, but none showed interest. They had to return to New York. Upon his return in 1925, Cagney immediately auditioned for his first non-dance role. He played a young tough guy in Maxwell Anderson's three-act play, Outside Looking In. Initially, Cagney thought he had no chance of getting the role, but he had one advantage, red hair. The character he auditioned for was called Red Maloney, and Cagney was a redhead too. Landing the role, Cagney began earning $200 a week. Reviews of the play were positive, particularly praising Cagney's performance. He then secured the lead role in George Abbott's production of Broadway in the West End from 1926 to 1927. As they were moving from New York to London's West End, the management wanted Cagney to join the cast. Cagney and his wife gave up their apartment, packed their bags, and loaded them onto a ship that was to take them to Britain. However, just before the couple sailed, Cagney received a message from the show's producer. They had changed their minds about hiring Cagney. This news devastated the actor and left him and his wife homeless. Cagney was on the verge of giving up his dream forever, but decided not to surrender. He opened a dance school for professionals, which demanded a tremendous amount of energy from him. Then he landed a role in the play Women Go On Forever, directed by John Cromwell, which ran for four months. Eventually torn between the play and managing the dance school, Cagney was so exhausted that he had no energy left. After the conclusion of Women Go On Forever and still running the dance school, Cagney got a role in a new play called Penny Arcade alongside Joan Blondell. Critics didn't like the play, but at the same time, they praised the performance of Cagney and Blondell. Vaudeville star Al Jolson, thinking the play has great potential for a film, bought the rights. Jolson then sold the play to Warner Bros. with one condition. They had to cast Cagney and Blondell in the film adaptation. Jack Warner of Warner Bros. opposed having Cagney and Blondell in Penny Arcade, which was now titled Sinner's Holiday. The reason was that he didn't believe the actors would succeed in Hollywood. However, Cagney and Blondell proved everyone wrong, and James received a three-week contract from Warner Bros. for $1,500. In the film Sinner's Holiday, Cagney played a tough guy with a troubled childhood. This archetype of a sympathetic bad boy became permanently associated with him. Cagney wasn't bothered by this at all. He knew that if a film required such a character, they would always turn to him. Soon, Cagney got a supporting role in the film The Public Enemy, where he played the best friend of the lead actor portrayed by Edward Woods. After a few days of shooting, the director took Cagney aside to talk. Cagney thought there was something wrong with his performance, but to his surprise, director William Wellman wanted Cagney to switch roles with Woods. Now, Cagney was in the lead role in a Hollywood film where he had to play an iconic scene. The film featured a scene that some consider one of the most famous in the history of cinema. In this scene, Cagney gets angry at his on-screen wife during breakfast and throws a grapefruit in her face. The role of the wife was played by Mae Clark. Her real husband attended the movie countless times just to watch this scene and laughed heartily every time. During the filming of this movie, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. started a charity drive 
The renowned actor expected everyone working on The Public Enemy to donate money to his cause. However, Cagney refused to join this initiative. He didn't mind contributing to charity, but he objected to being forced to donate. After this, Cagney earned the nickname The Professional Enemy. The famous grapefruit scene with its spontaneous cruelty resonated so well with the audience that Warner Bros. decided to create another scene they hoped would attract attention. In Smart Money, Cagney displayed physical cruelty towards a woman, slapping his co-star Evelyn Knapp. Meanwhile, Hollywood films were undergoing significant changes. Some moviegoers considered such films morally questionable, leading the film industry to adopt a specific set of rules. With these rules, known as the Hayes Code, Cagney's career as a bad guy was almost at an end. Therefore, Warner Bros. decided to change Cagney's image. Warner Bros. plan to keep Cagney in movies involved casting him in comedies. The film was called Blonde Crazy, where Cagney starred alongside Blondell again. As it turned out, audiences also liked Cagney in comedies. However, this did not bring him great joy because despite his growing popularity, his salary remained a source of disappointment. Cagney had several very successful films under his belt, and after simple calculations, he realized that he was making a lot of money for Warner Bros., but he himself was not getting much. When he asked Warner Bros. for a raise, they categorically refused. Additionally, Warner Bros. insisted that Cagney promote their films even if he wasn't involved in them. Cagney grew tired of this, and he left Hollywood, returning to New York, leaving his brother Bill to look after his apartment. While Cagney was in Hollywood, his brother, essentially acting as James's agent, managed to secure a significant raise in his salary and more personal freedom for him. When Cagney heard that he would now be earning $1,000 a week, he returned to Hollywood. His first film upon returning from New York was Taxi, 1932, in which Cagney danced on screen for the first time. This film was also the last time he allowed himself to be shot with live ammunition. In the 1930s, blank cartridges for revolvers were very expensive. To save money, studios made actors use live casings during film shoots. While filming Taxi, Cagney almost got shot. The film was a critical success. In the film, Cagney had to play an enraged taxi driver. However, there was one problem. Cagney didn't know how to drive, so before shooting, he had to hastily take driving lessons. The film Taxi is also known for one of the most misquoted lines attributed to Cagney. Many impressionists quoted him as saying, Mmm, you dirty rat. However, he actually said, Come out and take it, you dirty yellow-bellied rat, or I'll give it to you through the door. Despite its success, Cagney remained dissatisfied with his contract. He wanted more money for his successful films, but also offered to reduce his salary if his popularity declined. Warner Bros. refused, and Cagney again wanted to leave them. However, his contract made this virtually impossible. To terminate the contract with Warner Bros., Cagney offered to work for free. He said he would star in three films for zero dollars, and after that, they could terminate his contract. Warner Bros. rejected Cagney's proposal. At this moment, director Frank Capra came to his rescue. He negotiated a raise for Cagney to $3,000 a week, reduced the number of films with James to four per year, and secured a special promise from Warner Bros. The actor would receive top billing in all four films. James Cagney sought to help not only himself, but also those around him. He witnessed actors exhausting themselves, working a grueling 100 hours a week, with some of them young actors still teenagers. So Cagney and other actors, including Humphrey Bogart, formed the Screen Actors Guild, which was akin to a Hollywood workers' union. James Cagney also regularly sent money and goods to old friends from his neighborhood. After helping establish the Screen Actors Guild, James continued to make films for Warner Bros. However, in 1934, Warner Bros. forced Cagney to make five films, leading to the termination of his contract. Cagney, along with his brother William, did what most actors were afraid to do. They sued Warner Bros. The legal proceedings lasted several months, providing Cagney with some time for other pursuits. For many years, Cagney had an interest in agriculture. While his brother was in litigation with Warner Bros. in Los Angeles, Cagney worked on a small farm in the northern part of New York State, enjoying the simple farm life. However, as soon as he received an offer to star in a film, he immediately left the farm and returned to Hollywood. The call did not come from Warner Bros. The film that led Cagney to leave the farm was produced by Grand National Films. For this role, Cagney received $100,000 plus 10% of the profits, exactly what he wanted. Cagney made two films for Grand National, Great Guy and Something to Sing About. He received good reviews for both films, but unfortunately, Grand National Films couldn't compete with Warner Bros. The production quality did not match that of Warner Bros. A third film was planned, but Grand National ran out of money. While Cagney collaborated with Grand National Films, 
his brother continued the legal battle with Warner Bros. When the case for results came in, Cagney was pleasantly surprised. He did something many considered unthinkable. He won. Not only did he win the lawsuit, but Warner Bros. also wanted him back. They offered him $150,000 per film, a maximum of two films per year, and as the icing on the cake, Cagney was free to choose the films he wanted to be in. Victory over the powerful studio meant a lot not only for Cagney himself, but also for other actors fighting unacceptable contracts. In 1938, Cagney starred alongside Humphrey Bogart in the film Angels with Dirty Faces. Additionally, the cast included a group of actors known as the Dead End Kids, or D.E.K. These were performers who, like Cagney, grew up on the poor, dirty streets of New York. D.E.K. had a reputation for being unruly on set. During the filming of Angels with Dirty Faces, the young men went so far as to strip Bogart of his pants. However, when they attempted mischief with Cagney, things didn't go as planned. Another thing D.E.K. loved to do on set was to improvise their lines. In his first scene with Cagney, Leo Gorsi immediately took a creative approach to the script. What Gorsi didn't account for was Cagney's street smarts. To stop the relentless chatter, Cagney gave him a punch to the nose. After that, D.E.K. started behaving properly. Cagney was a tough guy, not only on screen, but also off screen. Many viewers perceived Cagney solely as a movie star hooligan. Therefore, the actor decided to surprise them with his next role. Producer Hal Wallace wanted to make a film about George M. Cohen, known as The Man Who Owned Broadway and the father of American musicals. The film was titled Yankee Doodle Dandy and it was not supposed to have lines like You Dirty Rat. Cagney had to do something he hadn't done in a long time, sing and dance. Yankee Doodle Dandy was a patriotic film made during an unusual time in American history, the height of World War II. The first day of shooting followed the infamous day, the attack on Pearl Harbor by Japan. Making this film right suddenly seemed incredibly important. The cast and crew worked in a patriotic frenzy as the United States' involvement in World War II gave them a sense that they might be sending the last message from the free world. The premiere collected $5,750,000. Many critics at the time declared Yankee Doodle Dandy to be Cagney's best film, a sentiment the actor himself was very proud of. Cagney poured his heart and soul into this film. In one scene, he performed a tap dance not in the script, and in another scene, he broke a rib but continued dancing. Nothing could stop Cagney from making this film a hit, and he succeeded. The film was nominated for eight Academy Awards and won three, including the Best Actor Award. Having received an Oscar, Cagney decided he was ready to start his own business. In March 1942, he and his brother William founded their own production company called Cagney Productions to release films through United Artists. For Cagney, this was a tense time. In addition to creating his own company, he also spent several weeks touring the United States, entertaining troops with vaudeville acts and scenes from Yankee Doodle Dandy. James Cagney was a passionate patriot. In September 1942, he was elected president of the Screen Actors Guild. Cagney Productions had a short-lived success, and ultimately everything ended sadly. Cagney had to hand over the company to Warner Bros. This meant Cagney returned to his usual roles as bad guys with troubled childhoods. In 1955, Cagney appeared in the film Mr. Roberts. The director was the notoriously famous John Ford, who directed The Grapes of Wrath. When Ford met Cagney at the airport, he warned Cagney that they would eventually butt heads. Cagney took these words as an invitation to a fight. Later, he said, I would have knocked his brains out. He was damn rude to everybody. He was a really mean old man. The next day, Cagney was late to the set, greatly angering Ford. Cagney interrupted the tirade saying, when I started this picture, you said you were going to butt heads before it was over. Well, I'm ready, are you? Ford walked away and they had no more problems. James Cagney continued to make quality films until 1962. However, it was after Billy Wilder's comedy, One, Two, Three, that Cagney decided to retire. He faced script problems and the shooting did not go well, requiring 50 takes for one scene, which was unusual for Cagney. The actor noted, I never had the slightest difficulty with fellow actors, except for one, two, three. I came close to giving Horst Bukals a punch in the nose. It was the first time Cagney considered leaving the film industry. He felt he had spent too many years in the studio and decided it was time to retire. After that, he retired from acting. His friendship with Pamela Tiffin was one of the few positive aspects at the time. Cagney gave her advice on acting, including the secret he had learned himself. You walk in, stand on both feet, look at the other guy in the eye, and tell the truth. Cagney remained in retirement for a long 20 years. He made a few public appearances, preferring to spend winters in Los Angeles and summers either on his Martha's Vineyard farm or at the Vernon Farm in New York. During his time in New York, he, along with Billy Vernon, often hosted parties at the Silverhorn Restaurant, where he met Marge Zimmerman. 
Around the same time, Cagney was diagnosed with glaucoma, and he started using eye drops, but vision problems persisted. Following Zimmerman's recommendation, he visited another doctor who stated that glaucoma was a misdiagnosis and that Cagney actually had diabetes. Zimmerman took care of Cagney, preparing him dietary meals. The success was evident. Cagney appeared at the American Film Institute's Life Achievement Award Ceremony in 1974, 20 pounds later, and his vision noticeably improved. Many Hollywood stars attended the ceremony more than at any other event in history. One reviewer even wrote that a bomb exploding in the dining room would have ended the film industry. In 1977, James Cagney experienced a minor stroke, leading to a deep depression. Zimmerman became his constant caregiver, traveling with Billy Vernon and with him wherever he went. After the stroke, Cagney could no longer engage in many of his favorite activities, including drawing, horseback riding, and dancing. Despite all these challenges, a bright spot appeared on the horizon. Inspired by his wife and Zimmerman, Cagney accepted director Milo's Foreman's offer to play a small role but pivotal role in the film Ragtime. For Ragtime, he came out of retirement in 1981. For this role, Cagney had to travel to the United Kingdom. While there, he caused a sensation. 20 years had passed since Cagney last appeared in a film, but when he appeared in the UK aboard the Queen Elizabeth II, he was greeted by a crowd of ecstatic fans unlike anything the security services had ever seen before. When he appeared at a celebration for the Queen Mother's birthday, she gave him a standing ovation and even went backstage to meet him, a gesture unprecedented for her. Watching Ragtime with an 80-year-old police commissioner, it wasn't immediately recognizable as James Cagney, but upon closer inspection, the audience noted the same slightly twisted and aggressive line of the mouth, and the eye ready to wink in true Cagney style. In 1984, the actor's health deteriorated significantly. His last role was the lead role in the film Terrible Joe Moran in 1984. Due to new strokes, he was confined to a wheelchair, but producers took this into account when crafting the plot. Rich Little dubbed his impaired speech, and fight scenes were used from Cagney's boxing film Winner Take All in 1932. On Easter Sunday in 1986, the long and successful life of Cagney came to an end. He passed away from a heart attack. Among those carrying his coffin were boxer Floyd Patterson, dancer Mikhail Baryshnikov, who hoped to play Cagney on Broadway, actor Ralph Bellamy, and director Milos Forman. The President of the United States at the time, Ronald Reagan, delivered the eulogy.